as you are sitting, let's come to the Lord once more in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, for your amazing love. Be with us as we delve into your word. Be with Pastor Kyle. Help us to be ready to hear what you have to say. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 I do appreciate you being here this morning. If you're a guest here with us, we've been working through uh, the story of Samson, looking at Samson's life in the Old Testament. So if you want to go ahead and take your Bibles, I hope you have them with you, and join me in the book of Judges. That's where we'll be this morning, kind of wrapping up this message series together. Uh, Pastor Chase preached last week uh, in this series, uh, and I haven't got back to go, hadn't had time to go back and look at that yet, just getting back from vacation last night, but I'm sure looking forward to that. I know it was a great time together in the Word. Uh, how many of you have never needed a vacation from your vacation? <laughs> couple of us. I feel like I need one of those uh, this morning. I, I'm, I'm pretty drained from a great week though and it's awesome to be able to be with family for a week and just uh, be out in the middle of nowhere where your phone don't work. That's a great place to be sometimes and I'm, I'm grateful for that opportunity. But we'll be in Judges this morning. In November of 1982 there was a football game played that has been called The Game. Just two words. It's kind of been tagged that way. Now I was, I'm not old enough to really remember the football game, but I saw the highlights of it, and I know uh, a lot about it because I've studied it a little bit because I'm like that. But it was a game, an in-state game, against two bitter, bitter California teams. It was an in-state rivalry that took, off place, that, uh, took place. They were playing for the 85th time, and they were both seeking after a trophy, an in-state trophy that the winner gets to take home with them and put in their trophy shelf till the next year called the Axe Trophy. It was the Stanford Cardinals versus the California Bruins. It was a close game throughout. Stanford quarterback was named John Elway. Maybe you've heard of him. He went on to play for the Broncos. But he was a quarterback of Stanford. He was young at the time. He got the ball with a minute and 27 seconds left in the game and drove his team down the field, this meticulous drive of short passes and short passes and getting out of bounds. He even completed a fourth down and 27 play that was just unbelievable. If you have time, you can go back and watch it. It's on YouTube. But he drove his team down to the 35-yard line and called timeout with just a few seconds left in the game. Just enough time for their field goal kicker to come out, kick the field goal. It was good, giving Stanford a 20-19 to lead with only four seconds left. The game was effectively over. There was only four seconds left. There still had to be a, a kickoff, of course, because there was time on the clock, but the broadcast booth, they were already putting away their things. The, the coaches and players were already celebrating on the sidelines, and during the TV timeout, just before that last kickoff, the band from Stanford had made their way out of the stands and were gathered there on the sidelines. So they, they lined up to kick off this, this inconsequential kickoff, California was already at a disadvantage because they made a bonehead decision. It was just a mistake, and they already only lined up 10 people on the field. So they already had uh, one less than Stanford did. But the Stanford kicker, Mark Harmon was his name, he did a squib kick. If you're unfamiliar with that, he didn't kick it long. He just, just kicked it kind of on the ground, just a few yards. And it was recovered by, really, this, this guy, Kevin Mion is his name. And he was a scrub wide receiver. He was a bench roll player. But he got it, and he ran around around for a little bit and as he ran around they were trying to tackle him but the game clock ran out while he was running around well lo and behold the Stanford players didn't realize that the game was over or they thought the game was over and they started celebrating some more they were running on the field and they were celebrating their victory the band started to come down on the field cannon confetti started to fall from the sky the Stanford coaches were already making their way over to the sidelines for their their press interviews about this this big win but what they failed to realize was that the whistle had never blown this guy Kevin Moen while he was running around just before he was tackled he flipped the ball backwards, and it was caught by one of his teammates. 
who was running around while people were trying to attack him. And right before he was tackled, he flipped the ball backwards, and it happened to be caught by one of his teammates. On and on, four different laterals, this was going on. Most of the Stanford players didn't even know the game was still in regulation. And they were trying, when they finally tried to realize what was happening and tried to make the tackle on the guy that was running down the field about to score a touchdown, they couldn't because the band was on the field. Their own band was on the field. 144 members Stanford band was on the field. 16 Stanford cheerleaders were on the field. So try as they made to get to this guy who's running down the field about to score a touchdown and end the game. The band was in the way. And this original guy that caught the, the kickoff, this scrub wide receiver named Kevin Milne, he actually had caught it last and he scored the touchdown wiping out a trombone player in the process. He was standing right in his way. It actually gave him a concussion. I remember reading about it. It's a fantastic story. What took place and what happened was simply this. They were counting their chickens before they hatch. You ever heard grandma say that? <laughs> they don't count your chickens before they hatch. They, they were too comfortable with their position. They were really letting their guards down. And because of that, it put them in a very, very difficult situation. A case in point of someone who lets their guard down and loses is the subject of the study that we've been in for the last four weeks. Samson. Samson was a guy who took everything for granted. Samson was a guy who was celebrating too early. Samson was a guy who had let his guard down. And he got in some real trouble because of it. Ultimately, he paid the ultimate price because he let his guard down. To give you a little context, if you've not been here with us or your guest, God had supernaturally gifted this man named Samson. It's supernaturally gifted. When we say supernatural, we're not just talking about someone who's built and, and born with some form of talent. But it was a very clear gift from God that Samson actually possessed. He had incredible strength, unworldly power. On top of that, he was handsome. And he was daring. He was clever. He carried himself with fearlessness and that fearlessness that he had was actually unrivaled. He defeated 30 pagan enemies at Ashketon, and, and he, he burned down the grain fields and the vineyards of the Philistine people by tying the tails of foxes together with torches. I don't know if you were able to study that or not, but it's an incredible, incredible story. He whipped a thousand enemy soldiers with nothing more than the jawbone of a donkey. Samson was somebody. Make no mistake, God gets all of the glory for all of those things. The wisdom that Samson possessed, the strength that he had, how clever he could be. God gets all of the glory for all of those things. And in an act of grace, in, in spite of Samson's foolish choices, because he made a lot of them, we've talked about that over the last several weeks, because of his own sinfulness, we've talked about that over the last few weeks, in an act of absolute grace, the Bible says in Judges chapter 14, verse 9, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily. In spite of the foolish things that God knew Samson would do, God's omniscient, right? He knows all things. He's sovereign over all things. Before Samson was created, God knew exactly what Samson's strengths and his weaknesses were, the choices that Samson would make. Yet in spite of all that, God's hand came upon Samson's life. And we talked about this last week. The Holy Spirit comes upon Samson so that he can accomplish the task that God has for him. We, we've talked about this before, but we need to mention it again. The Holy Spirit operates differently in the New Testament than the Holy Spirit operated in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the Holy Spirit comes within a person. Aren't you glad the Holy Spirit has indwelled you and come within you? And that Holy Spirit that has indwelled you and comes within you never leaves you. It, it seals you. The Holy Spirit seals you under the day of redemption. That's why the Scriptures teach that, that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God takes up residence in us when we say yes to Jesus. When, when we repent of our sins, trusting Jesus alone for salvation, the Holy Spirit takes up residence in us, never to leave us. But in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit didn't come within. The language is different. The Holy Spirit rests upon. And the Holy Spirit would rest upon both good men and bad men. 
good women and bad women. And the Holy Spirit would rest upon a person for this purpose so that they may accomplish God's will. Samson was a hot mess, but the Holy Spirit had come upon Samson, empowering him to take out a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey, empowering him to, to have the wisdom to, to tie the tails of foxes together with a torch to burn the vineyards and the grain fields of the evil Philistines, to, to defeat 30 enemy soldiers. This is not something Samson could do on his own, but the Holy Spirit had come upon him. In the same way that the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. We talked about uh, Brother David in Sunday school this morning. The Holy Spirit came upon Saul when he was king. But the Holy Spirit departed from Saul. And, and what we're seeing today is the Holy Spirit had departed from this man named Samson. And because of that, there was a mess. The Spirit came upon Samson because of that. Again, he accomplished supernatural things. He became a cultural icon. He, he became a rock star among his people. Everybody in Israel knew and revered the name of Samson because of what he could do and what he had accomplished. But picture this. In our text today, he's about middle-aged. He's basking in all of the glory that is Samson. He presumptuously assumes, I'm untouchable. I've, I've, I've been in situation after situation, Samson was thinking, where, where I, I escaped by the skin of my teeth, but I did. Time and time again, I've gotten out of it. I've used my strength. I've used my wisdom. I've gotten out of every bad situation. I've come out on top. Here's what Samson's doing. He's celebrating a little bit too early. He's celebrating a little bit too early. His guard is down. And, and, and this time he, he, he notices a Philistine woman. She's half his age. She's a knockout. And he falls head over heels. But she's a gold digger. She's a gold digger. Plain, simply, that she's conniving. And her name is Delilah. There's a reason we don't name our daughters Delilah. <laughs> now, if anybody here has a daughter or a granddaughter named Delilah, I am sorry. Because I've said that before, and I've had somebody just tear me up about it. They picked a bad choice for her. <laughs> There's a reason we don't name our dogs Delilah. It doesn't, doesn't happen. She's notorious for a reason. We're a family church. We won't get into great detail. But she's a harlot. And she's trouble. She's trouble with a capital T, but Samson can't see that. All he sees is Delilah. And she's beautiful. She, she's exactly what Samson doesn't need. But he appeals to his flesh. He appeals to the lust of his eyes, and that's who he wants. He chooses her. He falls head over heels. And the Philistine rulers, they come to Delilah. And they say to this woman, we, we want to take out this man named Samson, but we can't. Everything that we try to do, he, he foils. He, he's whipped a, a thousand of our best soldiers with nothing more than a, the jawbone of a donkey. He's burned down our fields of grain and our vineyards. We, we want to take him out, and we must take him out, but we, we can't do it. But... But you've got something we don't. And you can find out where the secret to his strength really lies. And we'll pay you for your trouble. And they offer to pay her 1,100 pieces of silver. If, if they could just let them know what is the secret to Samson's strength. That's difficult to say what, with any measure of certainty how much 1,100 pieces of silver would be today because the price of silver it fluctuates in the Old Testament. But we do know that it's more than Abraham paid for the piece of land in Genesis 23. We know that it's more than David paid for the threshing floor in 2 Samuel. We, we know that it's more than Jeremiah paid for an entire field in Jeremiah. 32. What we do is an enormous sum of money and it's exactly what she's after. It's what she wanted. That's the reason she entered into this quote-unquote relationship. 
with Samson to begin with. She's a gold digger. This is perfect. It's perfect. So she turns on her charm and she bats her eyes a few times and she asks this, this mighty man named Samson who views himself as invincible because of all that he's lived through, who is celebrating too early, whose guard is down. She says, what's the secret to your strength? Samson first tells her he lies. He said, well, if I'm tied up with seven strings, my strength will leave me. So she ties him up with seven strings while he is asleep. And, and she calls, the Philistines are coming. The Philistines are coming. They come in and Samson breaks off the strings and disposes of them in quick order. That wasn't it. She said, you made me look like a fool, Samson. You lied to me. What, what, what actually is it that gives you all of this strength? Samson says, well, I have to be tied up with new rope. If I'm tied up with new rope, I... My strength will be gone again. This is exactly what takes place. Nope. He takes on the Philistines again. He bursts through the rope with no problems whatsoever. You lied again, Delilah says. What is it? Tell me. Well, you just braid my hair. If my hair is braided, I'm weak. Once again, Samson, of course, lied to her. She braids his hair. He, Philistines come in, he takes them all out in short order. And then she uses that card. Here it is. You've all heard it. You don't love me. You don't really love me. If you really love me, you'd tell me. If you really cared, Samson, you'd tell me. You'd tell me where your strength really lies. And the Bible says that for days she pestered him about that. In fact, Judges 16, 16 says it this way about Samson. It says, his soul was vexed to death. This woman done went on her aggravating streak. And she, listen, there's a reason Solomon says in Proverbs 21, 9, listen to it. It is better to dwell on the corner of a rooftop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome woman. Amen? You shouldn't have said that, man. <laughs> That's what happens. She's vexed him. She's aggravated. She's pestered him. She's pouted and pried and went on this nagging spree until finally Samson breaks. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read together Judges 16, verses 17 through verse 20. Judges 16, 17 through verse 20. If you've got it, say, I've got it. So the rest of you, are y'all going to just listen? <laughs> if you've got it, say, I've got it. If you're ready for the word of God, say amen. He told her all of his heart, and he said to her, No razor has ever come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I'm shaven, then my strength will leave me, and I shall become weak like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all of his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up once more, for he has told me all of his heart. So the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in her hand. Then she lulled him to sleep on her knees and called for a man to come. And he came and shaven off the seven locks of his head. Then she began to torment him, and his strength left him. She said, Philistines are upon you, Samson. He woke from his sleep and said, I will go out as before, as other times, and shake myself free. He's celebrating early again, isn't he? He's presumptuous again. He's let his guard down. But listen, he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. You can be seated. Thank you for standing in honor and reverence of God's word. Note the last few words of that text. He did not know that the Lord had departed from him. Is there a sadder verse? I don't know that there is. He didn't even realize it. He was so full of himself. He was so presumptuous. He was, he was so used by this point to, to count his chickens before they hatched. He had taken so much that God had given him for granted that he was oblivious to the fact that the Lord wasn't even with him. The Holy Spirit had departed from him. It's terrifying thing. It's a, it's a heartbreaking thing. It's a crushing thing. 
but it's not surprising. Given our context, it's not surprising at all. And I say that it's unsurprising for a number of reasons. But, but chief among the reasons that it does not surprise me to read in the Old Testament that the Lord had departed from Samson was because he'd been celebrating too early. Like, like the Stanford football team and the band on the field. He, he had already won in his mind. His guard was down. He, he had grown accustomed at this point to taking for granted all that God had given him. Think, think about that for a moment. God had given him godly parents. Godly parents who, who were willing and ready and stood ready to give him great, sound, biblical advice who placed him under a Nazarite vow because the Lord had instructed to. He took that for granted. When they came with that advice, remember a couple of weeks ago, don't marry that, that woman. That's not a good idea. It won't end well. Took it for granted. Did his own thing. Messed up bad, didn't he? He took for granted the calling that God had placed upon his life to, to take out the Philistines and redeem God's people. His Nazarite vow, he had taken for granted the strength that he had. He had taken for granted the security that he had enjoyed. He had taken for granted his own God. He had taken for granted. He had taken all these things and more for granted. Here's, here's, here's how we take things for granted without even realizing it. This is what happened to Samson. He assumed that all these things would just always be there. He assumed that the blessings that they'd always be there. He assumed his strength would always be there. Listen carefully. He assumed godly parents would always be there. He assumed sound advice would always be there. This reservoir of strength that he had would never run dry presumptuously. He just figured he'd just keep living his best life. And he'd live to an old age and die happy in the arms of a beautiful woman. He took it all for granted. And, and taking for granted what God had so graciously provided for him, he lowered his guard. And he celebrated too early, and it cost him dearly. This, this man named Samson would be captured and thrown into a prison. This man named Samson would have his eyes gouged out of his head by his captors. This man named Samson would be a prison laborer in this Philistine dungeon. This man named Samson would be brought out from time to time to entertain the Philistine leaders. Do you really think about that? And the gravity of that, it's, it's, it sets on you, doesn't it? Here we have the most powerful man in Israel's storied history. The, the, as far as strength goes, physical strength, the most powerful man in the storied history of Israel, a man who seemed invincible, a man who had become nothing short of a national treasure and even a hero to his own people, a man who had risen through the ranks and become one of the most notable people alive, stumbling around blind while his enemies laughed at him. That's Samson. That, that's, that's him. What a sad story. What a sad chapter to this thrilling story of Samson's life. Samson, the free spirit, is taken captive. Samson, whose eyes had searched the horizon for his next daring adventure, gouged out. Samson, whose name alone struck fear in the hearts of his enemies, forced to entertain them. You may say, what does that have to do with me? Well, much like Samson, there's a story being written of your life and of mine. Much, much like Samson, there's a story that's being written. And much like Samson, the closing chapters can be terribly sad if we're not careful. And if we don't guard our hearts, you see, Satan is looming. 
Just like he was then, Satan is looming today and he's looking for his next unsuspecting victim. Let me tell you who he's looking for. And I've seen this experientially in my own life, but I've seen it in counseling sessions time and time and time again in pastoral ministry. He's looking for those who have their lives on autopilot like Samson did. He's looking for those who have taken the blessings that, that God has bestowed upon them for granted. He's looking for those who just assume life will always be good and those blessings will always be there and my health will always be fair. He's looking for those who take all of that for granted and are celebrating very early. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, that we should be sober and we should be vigilant because our adversary, the devil, he walks about like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. And he's looking for those who are celebrating early, whose guards are down. They're easy targets. I want us to do this this morning. I want us to take a personal inventory. And I'm going to give you three honest questions that we should ask ourselves. Just three. And they're simple questions, but this, the answer to these questions and what we do to these questions can determine for us how our story ends. It can determine for us how that last chapter of my life and your life is going to work out. If you're taking notes, I encourage you to jot these down. You say, well, it doesn't help me. It'll help somebody in your life. The first question is this. And, and by the way, if you can't answer these questions honestly, ask somebody that loves you. They'll help you. They'll help you. The first question is this. Does your perspective, does your perspective lead to gratitude or to griping? That's where we're going to start. Does your perspective, as you look around at your own life, the, the situation, the station of life that you may be in, as you look around at your own life, does it naturally lead you into a place of gratitude, thankfulness, or does it lead you to begin griping? Samson had lost perspective. He, he took for granted all that God had blessed him with. And, and here's something I found to be true. If a person is given over to complaining or griping in this life, if a person is given over to that, they too have lost perspective on things. They, they, they're not seeing things very clearly at all. They take for granted what God has done for them, what God has given to them. And it's a recipe for failure. So I'm going to ask you this. And I want you to be honest with yourselves and before God. You don't need to answer out loud. But if you can't answer, again, if you can't answer this, the person sitting beside you most likely can. You've got blinders. You don't see your own life the way they can see your life. I'm going to ask you these questions. When you look at your life, are you given to complaining about things? Negative Nancy, Eeyore, is that you? If so, trouble is coming. Trouble's coming. You're taking for granted what God has so graciously given you. This very day, think about this. This very day, there's someone somewhere who is praying for the very thing that you're complaining about. They're begging God for the very thing that you're griping over. Think about that for a moment. We take things for granted. When we do, we like Samson and his strength. We assume that these things will always be there when you need them. Your job. You assume it'll just always be there. You take it for granted. You complain about it. You hate it gripe about it it's a blessing it's a blessing think about that for a moment how many people would love that i could take you to some places today people would love to have your occupation they'd love to have a paycheck they'd love to have steadiness something there you've got it but we take it for granted your spouse take for granted 
If you complain and you're griping, here's what you're doing. You're taking he or she for granted. It's going to be disastrous if you don't change course. Your health, you just assume it'll always be good. I want to give you some news. I don't mean to be discouraging this morning. Let's just be real. It won't always be good. It's, it's not going to... As far as these physical bodies go, it ain't going to end well. Now those who are in Christ, praise God. To be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. But our physical body, things, things go downhill. And there, we've been trying to reverse that since time immemorial. We can't. It's the consequences and the effects of fallen man. We, we struggle. We get cancer. Our, our hearts start messing up. We get gout. We lose our hair. From the day we're born, our bodies start to break down. It's just reality. If you're in decent health, my brothers and sisters, please, oh, please don't take that for granted. It's a recipe for disaster. Our children, we complain, we gripe about them. What if suddenly they were taken away? We take things for granted. It's a recipe for disaster. Our parents, we complain and we gripe about sometimes our parents. I just spent a week with my mother-in-law. We take these things for granted. If we don't acknowledge, listen, if we don't acknowledge that these things are blessings from God and cherish them, monitor them, nurture them, demonstrate gratitude toward them like Samson's strength, we could easily lose them. We could easily lose them. What is it that you find yourself taking for granted? You say, I don't know. What is it that you complain about? And you found your answer. What is it you're griping about? You found your answer. Your job, or what if you go tomorrow and show up and you don't have it anymore? Your health, are you grateful for it? What happens if you go to the doctor next week and receive a diagnosis that you never saw coming because this happens every single day? Your spouse, your freedom, your parents, your children. How would you feel if, if one of those things were suddenly stripped away from you? If your perspective on life is leading you towards grumbling instead of gratitude, like Samson, a hard fall is coming. It's coming. So take an inventory. Look at the graciousness and the goodness of God toward you. James chapter 1, verse 17, James says it this way, the half-brother of Jesus says that every good gift, not some good gifts, not most good gifts, but every gift in your life is a gift from God. It comes down from the Father above. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says that we're to let the peace of Christ rule our hearts to which we were indeed called to one body and be what church? Be thankful. We're to be thankful. And, and that gratitude, natural gratitude, when our perspective is right and we're seeing things as we should see them as blessings from God, what happens is that begins to spill out in our lives. We, we're not gripers and we're not complainers and we don't see the glass always half empty. Those people are miserable. I don't, we don't see things like that anymore. Instead, 1 Corinthians 9, 11, you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. Gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude for your life. Gratitude is the attitude that sets the altitude. How you live here or way down is going to depend on your gratitude. Perspective. Perspective. So that's question one. Question two is this. Is there anything that you're doing right now that puts the blessings that God has granted you at risk? Is there anything that you're doing right now that puts the, the blessings, the things that God has so graciously given you, puts them at risk? Here's what I mean. Is there anything present in your life right now that would destroy your most precious blessings if it were made known? Certainly was in Samson's life, wasn't there? 
Numbers chapter 32, 23 says this, you've sinned against the Lord and to be sure your sin will find you out. A thing which is hidden will not remain hidden. It's going to come to light. We know that. Luke chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. There's nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will be not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Is there anything done in the dark that if it was brought to light would diminish or strip away or harm the blessings that you have already received? If so, recipe for disaster because it's going to be brought to light in time. Can't be hidden forever. Last question is this and then we're going to wrap up with some application. I want you to hear my heart on this one. But does the grass always look greener on the other side of the fence? Think about that for a moment. Does, does the grass always look greener on the other side of the fence? The Apostle Paul was writing to a young pastor named Timothy who was pastoring a very difficult church. He had a hard time. He must have been Baptist. It was a difficult church, difficult situation. And it would have been easy for a young pastor named Timothy to peek over the fence at the church down the road. He was a gifted young man. He probably could have went wherever he wanted to go. It would have been easier to look at the grass just down the road. So that's a little bit greener. But listen to something Paul says to him in 1 Timothy 6.6. 6, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. The lure of something better tomorrow will rob you of the joys that are offered today. Does the grass always look greener? It's a recipe for disaster. The good life, the, the one that truly satisfied, it exists when we stop looking for a better one. Let me say that again because it needs to be understood. The, the life of abundance, the good life, that, the abundant life it exists when we stop looking for something better. Stop looking for something greener. And ultimately, I found, by experience, by the way, through trial and through error, here's what I find. My own grass will get green if I water it. Ultimately, if anything, if anything, in the answers to those three questions that we just asked, if anything that you may have answered with, it caused your heart to have a little bit of pause right now, you're in grave danger. Grave danger. So, so what should I do? Very quickly, here's our application. It won't take but one second. <laughs> What should I do? You should set up some safeguards. We know that. Proverbs 4.23 tells us that we're to guard our hearts with all diligence, with everything that we have, because out of our heart springs the, the issues of our lives. How do we do that? Number one, by acknowledging and giving thanks for your blessings regularly. You've heard the song. We've sang it before. Count your blessings. I know it's just a song, but that is so powerful. Talk to somebody who's had one of those blessings stripped away. So powerful. Count your blessings. Acknowledge and give thanks for them. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. In everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Look around you, church, is what I'm saying. What, how much different would Samson's story been if he just looked around? All that God had given him had been good Church, I'm imploring you, look around you. Look at the family. Look at the home. Look at the job. Look at the health. We could go on and on and on here. Look at our church. Look around you. Acknowledge the goodness of God and the blessings that He's already given you. Be grateful. Number two, surround yourself with friends who have the same godly values and Godward aspirations that you do. One key thing that's missing in Samson's life, if you read the book of Judges, these four chapters that cover it, the entirety of these four chapters that tell his story, we don't have one singular mention of a godly friend that, that had permission to speak into his life. 
Not one instance where Samson had given a godly brother or sister permission to speak into his life. What that means is Samson has no mentors. Samson has no counselors. He has no advisors. He has no friends. He has nothing. Samson had isolated himself. And here's what that day. You will fall. We are codependent. There are no spiritual lone rangers. There is no such thing. Dear friend, you're not strong enough and you're not wise enough. And I know that's what culture loves to tell us. You're, you're enough, you're enough, you're enough. No, you're not. You need brothers and sisters in Christ who will love you enough to tell you when you're messing up and when you're heading in a bad direction or encourage you when you're heading in a good direction. We all need that. Samson needed that. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, a friend sharpens a friend. You need that. And lastly, application-wise, this is simple. Stop and smell the roses. Stop and smell the roses. This is an old adage, but it's true. We live in a rushed world, fast-paced society, microwave culture. And too often we move so quickly down the road of this life that we can't even enjoy the view. James 4.11 says, what is your life? It's just a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. Our time here is short. Short. We think we have all the time in the world. It's, it's really nothing in light of eternity. James says, it's a puff of smoke. It's here and it's gone. Stop and smell the roses. Enjoy it. It's okay. It's okay. So, so to wrap all of that up, there's one more aspect of Samson's story that's particularly helpful for people like me who have taken God's blessings for granted at some point. And, and some who've celebrated too early and assumed things would always be this way and found out they weren't and paid ultimate and very terrible consequence for it. While, while that's the final chapter of Samson's story, it's not the last sentence. And, and as I've mentioned, the Philistines had, had imprisoned this former strong man named Samson, had cut his hair, thrown him in a dungeon, but over time they had made a fatal mistake. They forgot to keep his hair cut. And it began to grow. And the leaders of the Philistines, they hosted this great big party and they invited all the governing officials of the Philistines into this great party. All the who's who, all the somebodies, the paparazzis there. They're all at this great temple. And they call for Samson to be brought into the banquet hall. He's going to entertain them. They want to watch this strong man named Samson stumble around blind. They want to watch him fall into the walls and... They, they want to watch him and make fun of him and jeer him. He's there for their amusement and for their entertainment. And Samson is standing before them. They're laughing, they're mocking, they're pointing. And Samson offers a prayer to God. A man who had it all, lost it all. He offers this prayer to God in Judges chapter 16, verse 26. Samson called to the Lord saying, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O God, that I may, with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines from my two eyes. Samson, who had forgotten God, remembered him. He calls upon him. You know how the story ends. This, this man named Samson is positioned between these two pillars. He, he pushes, and not with all his might, because his might was worthless empowered by God who had heard and answered his prayer. He pushes the pillars down, the building crumbles, falling upon the Philistines' governing officials. Effectively, this ruins the Philistines' anyway, period. And we see how that story unfolds a little bit later. But God heard his prayer. That's how Samson's story ends, an act of faith. So much so that in the Hebrews' Hall of Faith, in Hebrews chapter 11, where we have Abraham, whose faith was credited to him as righteousness listed there, and Noah, who by faith built this ark when the world jeered and sneered at him. By faith, he did what God had told him to do in obedience, and God blessed him, giving him safe passage, him and his family. Story after story after story of faith. The name of Samson is also found there. 
What that means is simply this. You, you, like Samson, may have taken God's blessings for granted. And you may have fallen. But there's not a period. It's just a comma. What you do next, it tells how you'll finish that story. Would you bow with me? We're going to have a hymn of invitation. As our musicians come, with every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to say to you, church, that pride goes before the fall. And you may be here today as we went through those questions. You say, oh, no. Oh, no. Like Samson, I've been celebrating too early. Like Samson, I've taken too much for granted. Like Samson, I've just presumptuously believed that my health would always be there, my strength would always be there, my family would always be there. Maybe today you'd like to say, Lord, like Samson, I'm going to remember you. I'm going to acknowledge the blessings that you've given me. And I'm going to ask you to once again strengthen me. Help me to be a person of gratitude. Help my perspective. See this world and all that you've done and all that you've created and all that you've so graciously given me. And not grumble about it, not complain about it, but praise you for it. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this text that we've been in over the last several weeks and what you've taught me through it, Lord. I, and reminded me, Lord, I thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And I pray, Lord, that you would strengthen us in, in our gratitude. That we would not be people who take these things for granted. We would not be people who isolate themselves, but we are surrounded by people who share the same goals and aspirations, the godly values that we share. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to stop, slow down, and enjoy the abundant life that you've given us. Father, in this time of invitation, we won't manipulate things. It's yours, not ours. We pray that if there is any person here who does not know you as Savior, that today they would ask Jesus to give them new life, repent, and trust Him alone for their salvation. For those of us who know Him, know you, Lord, draw us closer in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you